specializes in object-based learning in formal and informal environments. She holds a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center, CUNY, and currently works as the Assistant Director of the Youth and Family Programs at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. In the past, she worked as Associate Director of Education at the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, where she developed and presented educational programs exploring the history of Jews in America. For over a decade, she's led tours at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York and presents lectures, workshops, and guided tours in, the New, York, in New York City and the greater Philadelphia area. Please join me all in welcoming Dr. Katerina Romanenko today. We're so happy to have you here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So I guess I'll just start sharing uh, because there is a lot to cover. So brace yourself, we're going to kind of run through uh, a visual and personal story of a unique person that, to be honest, before I started to work on this talk, I never heard about. So hopefully you will find his personality as interesting as I did. Uh, first of all, can you hear me well? The sound? Okay. Um, so since you in this talk, you probably noticed the title of the talk, The Life of Nicholas Lohoff. And I'm just curious if anyone, if you want to put in the chat, if anyone ever heard about uh, this uh, person before, just kind of say, yes, I did. And maybe uh, notice the reason, uh, put the reason in. Uh, but I discovered him and it's actually kind of funny how, uh, when we were looking for content for online Fafa presence, uh, I wanted to give a talk. And as you may guess, Russian is my uh, native language. So I wanted to do something about uh, either Russian art or some, some connection with that. Uh, so I just went to Puffa database and I put the word Russian as a keyword. Believe it or not, two works that come up there. One is Lokov's portraits that we discussed. And the other one is some kind of uh, graphic connected with Prussia. So it's not even Russia, it's Russia. So I didn't really have that much choice uh, to uh, talk about something Russian in connection to Puffa's collection. Uh, now, Nicholas Lohov, um, appear, at the end, uh, is the person that deserves uh, maybe more than one talk because of uh, his lifelong project and his contribution to art history. So today, the idea is just to highlight his uh, biography, highlight what he has done, um, and um, just kind of to bring his name literally from obscurity. Now, why Violet Oakley? because the portrait that um, I'm going to discuss was made by her. Uh, now, Violet Oakley probably um, doesn't need long introduction, so I will just briefly talk about her. And I wanna clarify, this talk is about Lohoff, but there are some connections with Violet Oakley and, and Philadelphia uh, and America uh, in general. So um, hopefully you will find these connections also interesting. Interesting uh, connection is the fact that they are two years apart. Um, so they even like in the same uh, age group. So that means they will share some of the philosophies, some of the perceptions that marked a uh, certain time period in art history. And that's another connection between their personalities and their approach to art. So Violet Oakley, I'm sure you all uh, know, uh, her most famous thing is that she uh, is a female artist, very prominent, very successful at the time. Uh, she formed this collective with the Red Rose Girls, uh, successful illustrators. She attended PAFA very briefly and still, uh, and she uh, took classes with Cecilia Bow, and she called Cecilia Bow her uh, first master and also kind of saw herself as a product uh, of Pennsylvania Arts Academy. Um, now, uh, she became famous as a muralist uh, and she shares her perception of Renaissance and the idea that art should be uh, accessible to larger masses and that it should teach a lesson and it should kind of be humanistic in approach uh, would mark her career. Uh, and uh, as she is most famous for her uh, murals uh, in Harrisburg and her other mural projects, you cannot be a muralist without connection to Renaissance of some kind. So she was also a scholar of uh, Italian art and Italian Renaissance. Now, maybe less known is the fact that she was also very accomplished portraitist. I mean, with Cecilia Bor, she took portrait classes. However, uh, the fact that she started, she, she saw the, the beginning of her career, she considered to be a portraitist. It's also uh, probably less a known fact. 
Uh, now, in connection with the mural arts, as I said, you have to be a scholar of the Renaissance. So when she received her commission in 1902, she went to Italy to specifically study mural arts there. And also in Italy, she made sketches, she constantly made sketches of her friends, of her family, of and different people that she encountered. And they, some, some of them set for her, some of them she just sketched on the go. So here are a few female portraits uh, made in Italy uh, from different dates because she went multiple times back to Florence, back to Italy, uh, as she continued to work on her mural project. In one of those visits, she made a portrait of Nicholas Lohoff, uh, and this portrait is identified in, in our collection. And this is uh, not always happening. Many of her portraits are unknown individuals. Some of them have names. So this one uh, is named Nicholas Lohoff, uh, and there is no date, uh, but it looks like she, it was most likely made in 1920s. So the actual story of her encounter with Nicholas Lohoff is yet to be discovered. So if anyone ever read uh, and met any mentioning in her, I don't know, letters or diaries or whatsoever, uh, please let me know. Uh, I didn't yet come across the specific uh, explanation of how she met Lohov. But if we'll, as we will discover today, there are multiple occasions where she would meet him and get to know him. Um, now, the uh, portrait is, quite detailed so uh, and the fact that the artist kind of looks at us i mean the artist in the portrait uh suggests that it was not just occasional sketch in some social encounter it looks like he actually said for her and again uh, i hope uh we'll uh, discover um uh how like in what occasion she would meet him so when I saw this portrait, as I mentioned before, I had no idea who is uh, Nikolas Lohov or Nikolai Lohov, as he would be sound in Russian. So I Googled him, right? Almighty Google. And I was actually quite lucky uh, that um, in, 20, in 2017, there was a monograph in Russian written about the artist. Otherwise, uh, his name was forgotten in art history. There is some information from um, American collections that contain his art, but very, very, very limited and very, very incorrect in facts and dates. Uh, it looks like uh, there was no real consistency in how his biography was treated. So this monograph made by a uh, Russian art historian uh, Verisev and Maria Talai uh, reconstructs Lohov's lives, collects all possible evidence they were able to find in Russian archives, uh, in Florence, uh, in Italy. Um, they collected letters to friends mentioning Lohov and any uh, very thorough research uh, really bringing back to uh, us the life of this quite uh, remarkable man. So. Uh, most of my facts come out of this monograph, which is meticulously documented with references. Uh, so, uh, good source. He was born in Pskov, Russia, which is one of the oldest Russian cities. Very beautiful and very, I don't want to say word backward, but probably this is the right word to say at that time uh, that we're talking about, end, end of the 19th century. The uh, Great Russia, uh, just to give you an idea, so this is uh, Pskov, St. Petersburg will be somewhere here, Moscow somewhere deep inside the map here, uh, and Moscow and St. Petersburg, these are the centers of any um, any social or cultural activities, mostly St. Petersburg, not even Moscow. So nothing really happens in Pskov. It's like different Russia at the time. Uh, this is important because uh, when uh, we learn uh, his uh, personal story, we'll see how both his background in, in heart of Russia and his uh, further life in St. Petersburg uh, would affect his uh, perception on art and on the role of art in society and affect his uh, project. Uh, so, very unique photograph, which was uh, discovered uh, in archives. There is no other, like there is no young Lohov in uh, in visual sources, but this is his earliest known photograph, where he's 21 years old, uh, made in Pskov. His graduation paper, he finished high school. He was a very bad student, probably because of uh, health conditions. He had kind of early stages of tuberculosis, um, and uh, also because uh, he. He was just bad at math and other um, 
kind of sciencey things. Uh, he had inclination uh, to art. He started to draw very early. He didn't really have any professional training in art, but he really liked it at the very beginning. So at some point, his mother takes him out of the regular school and sends him to a uh, special school in St. Petersburg where they had emphasis on art education. But again, we're talking about kind of middle school and, and high school years of uh, some art education that he received. After that, he goes to St. Petersburg University. It looks like he started to study in the law, uh, in, uh, in the law but uh, he takes classes in uh, physics, um, anatomy, study of different animals, zoology, uh, and chemistry. And there is one of, one of the classes mentioned in his uh, diploma uh, when he finishes university uh, is specifically the study of the plant extracted pigments, like what kind of pigments uh, you can get from plants. So um, he, gets, he gets quite elaborate in-depth education, um, which is very, um, not directly connected to art, but as we will see, will be very important uh, in, in his project. Uh, so knowledge of uh, chemistry, knowledge of zoology, anatomy, and all these things. Now, in the university, we are in, 19, in, 1800, in 1890s in Russia, which is the uh, kind of peak of revolutionary activities. Uh, Russian uh, Tsarist regime uh, is outdated. Nicholas II uh, second is the Tsar that is, I mean, he is going to end up with the Russian Revolution. So there are reasons why it was happening. Um, there is uh, so much happening in Europe at the time in Russia with this backwardness and kind of not catching up industrially, not catching up politically, brings the situation to this when there are lots of upheaval and of course at the heart of all that is the students. So Lokov gets involved in revolutionary activity. He um, uh, gets in trouble in the university with different protests that students staged and at some point he is expelled from the university. He has to go back to uh, Pskov, uh, which is his hometown, but also serves as a city where uh, Russian authorities exile all troublemakers from St. Petersburg and Moscow. Because it's backward, because it's far away, because it's old Russia, they feel that it will be safe to put all these troublemakers there. They end up with cr creating a whole group of troublemakers exiled from Russia and St. Petersburg in Pskov. So uh, eventually, as you'll see, uh, Lokhov meets Lenin in Pskov, who is also in exile in Pskov. Um, now, this, the, the document that you see on the, next to the map is the police uh, supervision records. So he was put, uh, placed under uh, hidden surveillance. Now, hidden is not really because everybody knew if they were under surveillance, meaning that every step that he makes is uh, surveilled by police. And this is a report of his behavior quite interesting document like here in um, blue pencil it says uh, like secret and date and like where he went who he met and what we'll understand from his activities as a young revolutionary he was at the top of future uh, heads of the revolution again he meets Lenin who at that time is really nobody or like leader of a small party but as you I hope all know, know his uh, role in history future, in the future, uh, you can kind of see that um, Lokhov is engaged in, um, in, in, in the thickness of uh, revolutionary activities in Russia. Uh, Lenin uh, not only knew him personally, uh, they had personal arguments, there is exchange of letters between Lenin and other revolutionary uh, heads of the revolutionary activities, where he is concerned with Lokhov's not agreeing with the main party uh, line. Uh, so Lokhov's uh, status in the group uh, was important enough for Lenin to be concerned. Why I'm emphasizing it so much is that you kind of have to understand that Lenin, Trotsky, they all end up as heads of the Bolshevik parties, party leaders of the revolution in 1917. They uh, obviously turn uh, history around. Lokhov is equal with them, like he's on the same level as they are. And then we'll see what happens to him, which I find quite remarkable. Now here, I just couldn't resist and not to put um, images when I Googled Lenin at Pskov. They still have Lenin's museum. It has nothing to do with Lokov, but I thought I'll bring it up. They still have Lenin's museum. This is the room where he lived in, while he was in Pskov for a few months. This is a painting made by socialist realist artist Lenin standing 
um, uh, postcards to uh, main, the mainland and the painting is called the spring is coming. So metaphorically Lenin and the spring is coming and all that. Um, disclosure, the, this, the socialist Realist paintings is the actual area of my research, so so you can excuse my um, side note uh, on that uh, topic. Anyway, uh, so in 1901, as a result of the police supervision and as a result of his activities, he's actually helping uh, Lenin to start publishing Iskra, the main newspaper of uh, Socialist Democratic Party, uh, and he he's a real foot soldier of making it happen and. Uh, Iskra was published abroad. Uh, he he uh, is captured again by police and he's supposed to be exiled in Arhangelsk, which is the death sentence for anyone with tuberculosis of any stage. Uh, so he, instead of going all the way far north, uh, he and by the time he gets married, uh, they uh, run away. They basically cross the border. Uh, in her letters, um, Maria Lokhov describes how they did it through um, that, uh, they were smuggled abroad, basically, um, and he ends up in Brussels uh, and in other European cities actively participating in revolutionary activities. He starts to publish his own newspaper. He is part of the um, other newspaper, which is called uh, or the Workers' Thought. Uh, and this newspaper is arguing with Iskra, with Lenin's newspaper, because um, uh, Lokhov belonged to uh, economists' wing. They believed that proletariat should first win uh, labor rights, uh, like short work day, uh, weekends, uh, pay, etc. Uh, while uh, Lenin and his um, party uh, pushed for political um, revolution and then uh, establishment of proletariat as a, as a main class. So. Uh, frankly, when you read the exchange of letters and, and this whole inner party struggle uh, is, is just remarkable to what degree um, proletariat and people were second and these people were really fighting for, for political power. Uh, we, and also all the uh, emphasis on terrorist attacks and on the kind of bloody uh, turn of the political tables eventually will lead Lokhov to disengage himself completely from these activities. We will learn about it a bit later. Uh, but at that time, in 1903, he is uh, participating in the Second Congress of Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which took place in Brussels. He's not in this picture, as far as I can see, but this is Lenin, and he is a member of this group. So just again, um, his status in the party. Uh, he is um, the, he's the author of the Social Pyramid, uh, like cartoon, which was repeated then in, uh, in American uh, newspapers, uh, slightly changed. But if you ever saw this cartoon, just realize that Lokhov is the one who designed it in the first place uh, for specifically Russian context, uh, and then it was uh, repeated. But as I said, he's disillusioned and completely disengages himself from all revolutionary activities after 1905, when the Bloody Sunday happens, when the first uh, failed uh, bourgeois revolution happens in Russia. Uh, he just believes that whatever uh, socialist Democrats are trying to do is not what Russia needs and uh, he doesn't want to be part of it. Uh, he gets an amnesty after 1905, many, many uh, revolutionaries were um, excused and they were able to get back to Russia. He goes back to Moscow. His son is already born in Paris. Uh, they leave, uh, I'm sorry, he goes back to Pskov. This is his wife with their son and uh, Lokhov himself with their son. Uh, and uh, he starts to focus on his artistic production. It looks like he started to make some copies in the museums and sold some copies of in the museums um, while they were abroad, but in 1907, he uh, is quite famous uh, and, uh, and uh, prominent Russian collectors start to purchase his copies of the Renaissance masters, of also of um, uh, Holland masters and um, some other uh, great artists of the past. In 1907, he goes abroad again, this time on a commission uh, for, from the Hermitage Museum to make copies uh, for Hermitage. Now he goes back and forth, and in 1910, 1910 he meets with um, Ivan Tsvetaev, his father of Marina Tsvetaev, if you're familiar with Russian great poetess. 
so, but he is uh, the founder of the Museum of Fine Art in Moscow, and he wants to create a whole wing of copies of Renaissance and European masters, because obviously uh, we are in um, uh, 19th century and early 20th century, there is photography is not capable yet to capture uh, artworks and there is no zoom and there is no internet. So the only way for Russians to see uh, great Renaissance masters is either to go to Italy or to have copies uh, brought to Russia, especially with anything that has to do with frescoes. Now, uh, Tutai finds a sponsor for Lohov's dream to make, um, to create collection of Renaissance masters uh, in Russian museum. And this is Vladimir Yakunchikov, who is a uh, tradesman, businessman, but also a philanthropist, and he's uh, the one who sponsors lots of art projects in Russia. So he gets a stipend, annual stip stipend, and he goes to Italy, and this is a letter where he kind of uh, communicates with Tsutaif, and they decide back and forth that he will create 70 copies for the museum. 70 copies of large-scale frescoes of Titian, of... Uh, um, Raphael and all other great masters. Now, by 1914, he created at least nine copies. It's about a year per copy, to, and he made like, sometimes more. And these works were sent to Russia, and this is an uh, English um, uh, transcript of uh, which works were sent. So you can see Bellini and Raphael and Castagna, so all uh, masters of the Renaissance. They were received by uh, Moscow uh, Fine Art Museum in Moscow, and then their trace disappears. They, they don't know where they are. Uh, last year, the researchers were able to find that actually almost right away they were sent to local museum uh, and in Palich, which is like another, like in the middle of nowhere. And Palich Museum have no idea, has no idea where this, where this art works now, though some of the reproductions appear in museum publications in the early years. So there are some nine copies of early Lokhov's uh, reproductions of uh, Renaissance masters somewhere in Russia, and they are hopefully yet to be discovered, though they probably vanished with the World War II and all other things that happened. Now, that's when his life turns around and actually kind of <laughs> his dream of creating these copies for, uh, for Russia, for Russian museum, for Russian um, uh, people uh, dies, but it will take a while uh, for him to realize that. 1913, Svetayev dies. So the main proponent of the copy wing for Russian state museum um, dies. Uh, 1914, World War I, uh, Lokhov is cut off from Russia um, and basically uh, he gets no money, uh, but he continues to work on his projects because he still feels that uh, at some point the collection will find its way to Russia. 1916, Yakunchikov dies uh, and he loses his any money, monetary support that he had before. And then of course, 1917, Russian Bolshevik revolution happens and uh, the whole project uh, just nobody knows if it's ever going to be relevant for, uh, for Russian and for, for Soviet Republic. But he continues to work. And I think it's time for us to take a look at some of his um, paintings. Now, uh, what's important is that uh, he's not just copyist. His uh, goal is not just to, to make copies of great works. Because of his background in university, and I mentioned how specifically he studied all uh, kind of back end of art making, he is able to actually reconstruct uh, many of the processes of art making by great masters. Um, what he's able to do is to find a way to recreate frescoes on canvas, uh, which also connects us with the American uh, muralist uh, and Violet Oakley specifically, because she also made her uh, majority of her works on canvas, and that's um, the way American muralists are usually working. So he um, studies the chemistry of the pigments that were used. He is working with varnishes. He's able to kind of reconstruct the actual process of the artist. Um, now you probably know that uh, when uh, Ital Italian artists worked on frescoes, they would uh, kind of uh, create a wet fresco and uh, the patch would have to be finished during one day, otherwise it gets dry. So frescoes, they kind of exist in uh, patches. 
Um, he discovered the process which helps to avoid that necessity to finish the work in one day. But in his reconstructions, he followed and kind of recreated the outlines of the original day work uh, of the Italian masters. So on black and white uh, image, um, you can see the uh, St. Francis in uh, preaching to birds uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the chapel and the recreation of the fresco on canvas by, by Loho. Here's another example just kind of helps you to see uh, how um, he is able to create, he reconstructs, uh, meticulously reconstructs the original fresco, but then he would start the aging process. So her, first he recreates the artwork uh, in a way it was, it looked like when it was finished. And then he makes, makes it look old and dirty and damaged basically. Um, and at some point um, he met, uh, people would ask him uh, to not do that, just to stop at the time when, when he just reconstructs the fresco. And he would do uh, two versions, one is new, one is old. He was also, he, later on in the 30s, he would use a glass, uh, kind of tanned, scratched glass, and he would uh, show the new fresco, the way it looked as it was finished, and then he would pla place a glass in front of it to, to show people how it, what age basically is doing to, uh, to the artwork. And of course, this is the, in the middle is the picture of Lohoff next to his um, copy. Now, um, with the funding ending, uh, he had to find means to leave and he, he teaches a little bit. Uh, he also works for Italian museums uh, on reconstruction projects uh, and on uh, restoration projects. For example, he um, recreated the fresco uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, church. Uh, so the uh, fresco that you see in the uh, on the building is Lohoff's recreation of the original, while the original uh, very poorly survived uh, and it's in the museum now. So we see Lohoff in, on the walls of the churches in Italy. He was extremely valued by Italian museums. He was the expert, they would call him Professor Russo uh, and uh, many people would get consultations from him about um, Renaissance uh, um, technique which is probably how Oakley met him. One of the potential uh, reasons she would look for Lohoff is because he had this reputation and he knew ins and outs of Italian masters. Uh, another example, um, how his copies helped basically preserve the frescoes which otherwise were in very poor condition. Now we're talking about 1920s, 1930s. Obviously in our days, many of these frescoes are reconstructed uh, or some of them actually lost. There are some works of Lohoff that uh, preserve the, the frescoes that disappeared uh, uh, in our days. Um, so here you have um, uh, his copy. Uh, this is the original. This is his copy. And you can see some aging process is preserved, but he's kind of finding the middle ground. Uh, and this is black and white. I just thought that it might be better visible uh, how damaged the fresco was um, when he started to work on it. Now, this uh, fame, uh, this reputation uh, as a great copyist uh, reached the United States. And in 1920s, uh, he uh, got uh, in touch or they got in touch with him uh, from the Fogg Art Museum. Now, what's interesting that Fogg Art Museum was founded as a teaching institute. Uh, so the idea of having copies of great works there was initially on the mission of this institution. And later on, uh, it kind of uh, turned into um, the Museum of Original Works of Art. So uh, it's a little bit similar. Like we have this idea that copy is never as good as originals, which I kind of sign up <laughs> for. Uh, but sometimes when you have no other way to see the original copies uh, may do, and also the productions uh, of great paintings in books, uh, it's still a reproduction. So obviously it's better to see the original. Now, um, these quotes are from the um, notes from Fog Art Museum when they purchased the uh, two of uh, Lohoff's work. Uh, Gazzoli writes, uh, that, writes about Lohoff that he is artist of remarkable gift. He has this special understanding of old masters. He reproduces the technique uh, and understands the methods uh, of the artist. So 
already he is appreciated as more than just a copyist, but really as a reconstructor. Um, in some place it's mentioned as facsimile of old master uh, works. Uh, but what's interesting in this quote is it's also this highlighting that um, since it's uh, virtually or extremely difficult to preserve frescoes and also to transport frescoes, at least in 1920s, 1930s technology, um, the way to re reproducing them is almost like the only way uh, for Italian paintings to be studied in America. So uh, that's why uh, Americans are interested in purchasing these works. So Folk Museum of Art purchased uh, Lokhov's, um, several of his uh, works here. Um, and uh, and it, the note also says that since these are copies, we are, they were placed in the library and in the study hall. So again, like they, they have this kind of secondary status, even though some other people said that we, we should look at these works as the creations of Lohovs because he is not only copying old masters, but he's recreating something uh, of his own. The real life turning event for Lokov would be meeting Bernard Bernson, um, the American art historian and specialist in Renaissance art, because he will bring him, um, I'm going to skip that, uh, he will bring him in touch with other uh, American art collectors. And that's how Lokov would survive uh, the time period when um, nobody was purchasing his work uh, due to really changing interest in uh, and also uh, the Great Depression and eventually World War II. So um, uh, the, this is the quote from uh, Bernson's uh, wife when she describes how they met Lokhov, how surprised they were to find out the quality of his copies. This is a sketch of him working in front of Simone Martini. And uh, this, so on the left is his copy and on the right is the original. Now it was very hard to find kind of matching so colors probably are off, but I still, I hope this detail kind of will help you to show, uh, to help you to see the uh, level of his uh, truthfulness and also the level where he reconstructs the original colors. Blue is one of the colors that really, really fade away. Uh, and so uh, we can appreciate the way original blue would look like um, in Martini's work. Uh, Again, just to emphasize the laboriousness of his process and his dedication uh, for this, he worked 18 months on Birth of Venus and then six months just to make it look old, to age it. So it, it's like what, almost two years uh, on this great painting. Um, here, same uh, with, the, with this work, which was apparently at that time in extremely bad condition. So. I, uh, now it's clean because on the web, if you Google it, you'll find pretty clean, uh, nice looking images, but I, I was able to find older reproductions. So uh, we tend to see uh, Renaissance Masters is kind of dark, uh, shadowy, but it's all varnish that was applied in the later years. So originally they would look much kitschier, if I may say, because it's too bright, too happy, uh, but that's how it originally looked like. By 1930s, he creates over 40 copies. This is the Google kind of snapshot, um, uh, and it only shows about 16 works, but he makes over 40 copies. He works uh, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, he works on materials and pigments at night. So this person's uh, dedication to this project is insane. Uh, and what makes me really sad is realization that uh, as we, as we, go into 1930s and 1940s, he, he probably by the time already understood that Soviet Russia is not going to take this project and yet he continues uh, to work on it. Um, he starts to sell, the, initially he didn't want to sell any of the copies, but then he kind of gives up to financial need and he starts to sell it. And then he would recreate the second copy for the collection because the idea was is to make this 70 copies of the collection that would go to Russia. But he made multiple copies of the same work, like two or three for different collectors. So you can find Lohoff's work of great masters in different institutions in Australia, in Europe, as well as in America. Now, the question about his own art, yes, uh, he made his own art, but he always felt that, uh, and he actually wrote it uh, in a letter that, why would I make my own art? I will never, never be able to 
kind of to match uh, the great masters that I'm copying. So I guess when you copy the, someone that great, you realize the inferiority of your own production. But here are some of the landscapes that uh, of Italy that he made, about 10 surviving. Um, very different in style, I would say, but um, uh, here they are. And he, he, he was able to sell some of them, but it was not the main thing for him. Another like kind of important meet and meet up and, and the connection with Papa. This is a little twisted connection with Papa, but I with Papa, but I was able happy to find it. Is uh, his meeting of Countess of Berkeley, uh, Mary Elman Lowell, uh, and she is a wealthy American and from like very long uh, connection to the revolution. Her family is extremely old. Um, uh, in American history, but uh, she married um, Lord of Berkeley, becomes Lady of Berkeley, buys a house in Florence, and she is this kind of social American. Many, many people come through her house. Another potential, that's how Lohoff meets Oakley because of the American connection. Uh, in the same house, he meets uh, the Kiriko and other famous artists at the time. The Kiriko was married to um, Russian. I didn't know that. Uh, so there are some connections there, uh, but most importantly, um, she is a graduate of PAFA as well, uh, and she purchases uh, some of his work. So here's the fresco that he um, made for her, and this is her house, and you can see the same work uh, on the wall there, and uh, on the black and white photograph, he works on, on that uh, painting. Now, the actual person who would eventually bring the majority of Lohoff's connection, collection to America would be Helen Clay Freak, who met him through Berenson uh, in, the in 28, uh, and she got interested and eventually purchased a giant fresco, um, Madonna and Child, for Freak uh, Art Library. So here is the, from, probably from 1970s, the shot of the reading room, uh, with the fresco on the wall. And this is the postcard, uh, which you'll see in a second. Uh, now, um, it took him eight months to work on this fresco and reconstruct it, and she paid um, $8,000 um, for, for, for this project. And um, this is the postcard that I just showed you and the text from a Russian-speaking librarian uh, to Maria Lokhov, to uh, Lokhov's wife, saying that, and you'll be happy to find out that the work of your husband was placed on, uh, on like in the center of the wall in the reading room, in the honorable place, as she said. Uh, and this is the sketches that we we have from Lokhov in exchange, exchanging it with uh, um, with Mrs. Miss Frick uh, of how the fresco was actually reconstructed. So you can see that he worked on, on light and positioning it and on size and it's it, it really, really elaborate project that uh, went into it. However, with the Great Depression and the World War I, World War II starting, uh, uh, Frick is not buying Lokhoff's work. She's kind of postponing everything, postponing funding. He writes her desperate letters trying to explain that he, in order for him to continue, he needs money. But in the 40s, uh, there are no commissions, there is no money, they barely survive in the war, um, and he falls into depression. And this is a letter of his wife uh, writing about that he, would, he was kind of sitting, for, like his health is also getting poor, and he would sit for hours just kind of looking into empty space in front of him because um, obviously with the war raging, um, he could not even hope that his collection will find the original placement in the Russian Museum, but he was probably concerned that it all, uh, it will survive in any way. So uh, this is his wife and him in the early years, but I just, it's a lovely photograph, I think. He dies in 1948 um, from lung cancer um, and um, he's survived by his wife. This is the postcard she sends to friends in Canada uh, saying that he passed away. So uh, they survived the war. The, um, the, the studio that he rented for his huge project, now imagine it's now packed with 40 or more paintings of large scale. Uh, it survived the war. There were some bombing, the windows were sh shattered. So, um, it, but uh, at least uh, the paintings were not destroyed, uh, but uh, Lohoff really uh, did not see any positive 
light uh, for his collection. Now his wife would religiously take on uh, herself to find home for his um, project. But his dying wish was to give it to Russia. So he contact, she contacts uh, Grabar, who is, uh, the minister, who is in the Minister of Culture, uh, for Russia, she wants. She cannot donate the uh, collection because she just needs means to survive. They have two children by that time, so she offers to sell it for a very cheap price. But uh, world has moved on. Photography enables to create artworks by that time, and um, the Soviet uh, museums, similar to uh, other museums, are not interested in copies. So uh, kind of politely, he and also don't forget that he is. Uh, um, unreturnable citizen did not support the revolution so like his status is not really fitting the agenda of great Soviet artists so she, she he rejects uh, quite politely but uh, dismissingly um, rejects the collection now the real pain uh, painful uh, detail is that as she's waiting for Grabar's uh, answer Metropolitan Museum wanted to buy um, Lohov's collection the entire collection um, for for quite uh, vigorous sum, and she refuses for because she feels that she needs to try Soviet Russia first. So we could have it in New York, uh, but that didn't happen. And then later on, Australia wanted to buy it for any money. And uh, but at that time, she is already in talks with uh, Freak, um, with Helen Freak about purchasing uh, the collection for Pittsburgh uh, Museum. So, and in her, one of her postcards, she says, no, um, I, I'm not sending it to Australia. So Australia was way too much for her, but I'm sure she regretted that it, it didn't go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, um, uh, so, so Helen Frick purchases the work, uh, all 22 for $40,000, uh, to which uh, Maria Lohoff writes in, to, to a friend that, 17 years of life, 10 hours of work a day, and also sleepless nights uh, ended up in $40,000, which is not a big sum for a lifelong project. However, at least it was, uh, it found a permanent home. First, it was placed in Pittsburgh University um, throughout the Science Cathedral, I think it's called, the Cathedral of Knowledge. But in uh, 15, in 19, um, in 1959, but in 1965, uh, another building was built and opened, um, well, uh, Frick uh, Fine Arts Building, uh, and the collection is uh, placed in the court, courtyard. So I don't know if you can see, but here are the works of Lohov all around and on the walls. Uh, and now it's called the cloister, Lohov's uh, Cloister. That's how it looks from the inside. And that brings us to the conclusion of this talk. Um, and kind of taking it back to Violet Oakley and the fate of the artists who are attached to certain ideas, to certain aesthetic ideas. Oakley um, kind of was forgotten in art history, partially due to her woman status, but also partially because of her attachment to Victorian aesthetics and kind of figurative art in a time when modernism was making stand and was really not uh, sharing the same aesthetics. Lohov was completely forgotten at some point uh, because of his attachment to uh, certain aesthetic tradition and also to uh, kind of sacrificing his artistic uh, talent and his uh, you know, artistic status almost to the status of copyist, which as great he, as he was, still secondary status, it's not original art. And then of course, with the development of technology, uh, photography took over any copying. Uh, and now we have technology able to you know, reproduce any work by uh, pixels, including chemical um, uh, components. Uh, so um, his project was you know, kind of maybe uh, not as on demand as he it hoped it would be. I have to say that I was in Pittsburgh uh, this year. We went with uh, my son to check out Pittsburgh University and I didn't even know, like I di had no idea. Otherwise I would definitely visit the cloister. That's another reason to go back to Pittsburgh for me now at least. If anyone visited it and want to share anything in the comments, if you um, saw uh, um, Lohov's works there, uh, please share.
but here you have uh, Violet Oakley's self-portrait, Lohoff's self-portrait. I didn't know, maybe I'm reading into it, but he looks sad. Uh, and then her portrait of him in his prime with very intense gaze, kind of looking into future almost. Um, and um, at least we recovered some of his stories, some of his story in this talk. It makes me feel good. Thank you. That would be it. Thank you so much, Katarina. That was a, a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> appreciate it. There's so, so much in that story, um, historically, and, and connecting it back to one of Papa's alums. Um, it's great. So we have um, a little over 10 minutes for questions. We've already gotten a couple in the chat, but feel free to drop more question thoughts, um, resources. It's, it's so interesting to kind of, I feel like you're, um, you're uncovering this story, and it, it'd be great if other people have connections or have seen the work in person in Pittsburgh as well. Um, I, to start with, I did want to, Aaron had just kind of a straightforward question that I, I wish I, I knew the answer to, but I, I Googled and still didn't know is, do you say Poskov? Pos, how did you say Skov. that? Skov. Um, oh, where's Skov? So it's, it's on the, uh, Western border, but it's Russia is the heart of Russia. Not Belarus. Thank you. So, no Lukashenko there. And then um, Lawrence had a question that I find really fascinating. So thinking about um, asking if Lokhov had difficulties in gaining access to these original paintings. Um, so um, that's actually a very good question. And of course, for time constraints, I didn't cover that. Um, he gained the reputation of a great scholar of Italian art and a reconstructionist uh, that he was able to get access to original paintings. Now, in order for him to reconstruct uh, these frescoes, and you saw in uh, photographs, it's not just like standing in front of it with an easel, right? It had to be quite elaborate structure that would stretch his canvas and the whole process. So he had to uh, reserve the space and reserve the time. And there is exchange, uh, like he mentions that, oh, I finally got my turn to do, like, to do a certain fresco. Um, so yeah, it was a whole ongoing thing with the Italian government. He had to apply for permission. Uh, partially the reason he focused on Italian artists, uh, uh, because in England, for example, they only allowed to make copies uh, like twice a week for two hours, so it was not enough for him, so he focused his uh, efforts on Italy. So yeah, um, it was a whole project that, uh, and because of his reputation, he was able to gain access. There was a cute story when artists, uh, somebody else wanted to make copies and he wrote to Lokhov if you, he would give him his turn. <laughs> so that happened too. That's very sweet. Um, it's also such an interesting connection to PAFA since we are not just an art museum but in our school and copying the masters and the works in our museum is such an important integral part of our, our education. Um, I hope that we can share this later with more students just because that's they're in some ways following a little bit in his footsteps um, but more part of the idea of copying, actually, uh, one of the reasons I was excited to find Lokhov's uh, um, in Pafa's collection, I wanted to talk about connecting Russian Academy and American Academy because they share in the educational efforts the same difficulty, right? We don't have old masters. Russia has old masters from, you know, kind of Rublev and all uh, church related frescoes, but it's a little bit different. Um, so I, and I kind of assume that Lohov was going to be, because he's so great in skill, I assume he'll be academician, like he will be part of the Russian Academy, but he's not. <laughs> so I had to take my talk somewhere else. But if we will focus on idea of a copy for academies, uh, it, it was essential and I mean, artists learned by copying others. Renaissance artists learned by copying their predecessors. So this whole idea of copying in order to learn um, is, is essential and central in art education. So in this regard, uh, Lohov is really, uh, you know, serving his need. And then uh, as much as we, like, we miss our cast hall uh, for obvious reasons, right? This is the cop, as, as copy east as it gets. Uh, but of course, with sculpture, it's slightly different because you have an illusion of actual replica because you can make a mold. Now with painting, it was always a little bit problematic 
Uh, that's why Lokov is unique because every expert on the topic agrees that his copies are of superior quality and they're not really copies but reconstructions of the originals. So um, in, in multiple occasions I read it in many different places whoever mentions him. And it's so interesting to think of that too. I mean your topic or your talk you talk about googling him and, and it's hard to as like a contemporary artist and human to think about you, how important these copies would be to disseminate those images and, you know, not pre-internet, pre-photography. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so the article from 1921, the, where the wife of Berenson is writing about this, this artist who's like a genius of his trade uh, and consciously choosing this kind of secondary trade of copyist, um, and she starts a story saying that when we were in Italy, our friends kept nagging, you must see him, you must see him. And they didn't want to go because like, why would they go to see copies of Italian artists while I'm in Italy? It's like, it just sounded completely ridiculous. But their friends insisted and uh, they went and she and Bernson, who was an expert of Italian art, so he would know what he's talking about. Uh, they saw that the way he reconstructs uh, the works are unique. Mm -hmm. He was also a great scholar and he was also a great uh, teacher because he was extremely gen generous in his uh, knowledge. So uh, he would share his expertise with anyone who would ask a question. And I feel that um, that would be connection with Oakley because if she would come to him to learn, he would teach her, she, he would explain to her. Yeah, and that's a great transition to a question that we have from Mary Ellen, um, asking if Lokov trained students or had apprentice, apprentices that you know of. He, uh, he didn't really had any, uh, he had assistance on temporary base because just because of the scale. Uh, he had artists who worked with him and for a short period of time, and we have memoirs of, uh, and kind of, uh, yeah, when he uh, when they were publishing the book, they asked uh, anyone who knew Lokhov. So there was some artist who would say that I came and I worked with Lokhov for a while. So he had followers, not so much. He didn't teach uh, as a professor, but he had followers. Um, and then again, any other artist who worked on uh, restoration projects would get consultations from him. Great to know. Um, and Feel free folks, if we have, we just have a couple minutes left. So if you have any burning questions, make sure to put them in the chat or unmute yourself to ask them. Um, if you prefer that way as well, that's fine with us. Um, oh, maybe we have somebody. Eileen, are you asking a question? Uh, I'm not asking a question, but I just wanted to tell Katarina that I've been in Skov and oh. um, I thought I was the only one that ever heard of Skov, but uh, last year, they had a contemporary opera by the name of uh, Denise and Katya, and it's based on this young, two young people who were born in Skov. I don't know if you, you should look it up, Katarina. I think you would find it interesting. It's okay, Denise and Katya? Excuse me? Uh, the name of the artist, Denise and Katya? No, it's the name of the opera. Oh, opera, okay. Opera. And it was done by uh, the Opera Company of Philadelphia last year, part of their contemporary art scene, I mean, a contemporary opera. So you might enjoy looking it up and reading their story. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I never expected to hear Scov again after I left. So here's the second time. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I was in Pskov. I was in kind of nearby maybe, but Though it's like this magnificent old Kremlin, you know, the churches mm -hmm. with golden onion domes and things like that. I was really stunned to find out that they still have an open museum of Lenin and they have three people who right. work there. <laughs> it's, it's like, I mean, my childhood, remember, I'm coming from a country with personality cults, so I'm like, oh, Lenin. <laughs> so it, it, so is even now it's still very very backward in terms of like they it's basically still Soviet city and still very old Russian city so it's it's interesting right, right. yeah um, thank you very interesting oh thank you so yeah with the so what what I mean many aspects I didn't cover yet if that's I, I was joking with Abby it, it should be like I can probably now teach a class on that 
Um, there are some interesting stories with Lokov, and Abby, I promise not to go over time, I'll just mention. I focused on his frescoes, on his connection with America, uh, but he also, um, there are some amazing stories when he restored Veronese. Uh, the, the Veronese villa was, uh, during World War I, German soldiers were there, uh, and they, you know, like, we know how war treats artwork. So they were, and Veronese is famous for very kind of thin layer of frescoes. So they were visually practically disappearing and Lokov was able to reconstruct it. Another lovely story is when, when uh, revolution started, somebody was able to smuggle out uh, the giant fresco of um, uh, Fragonard. Uh, but because it was rolled, not fresco, I mean, big canvas of Fragonar, because it was rolled and kind of, you know, like they smuggled it, so it wasn't really luxurious temperature controlled shipping. Uh, when they unrolled it, the paint literally fell off, like they was basically destroyed. Uh, and the person was hoping to make some money by selling it. So Lokov was able actually to help them to reconstruct it and smooth out the folds, etc. So um, he's, he had the magic touch and he saved a lot of works of art. And what kind of, I, I'm not an expert on that. I'm actually look forward to, to read more about it because what I started to be interested in, and um, they describe uh, the, the people in the 30s and 20s, when we talk, they talk about Lokov, they describe frescoes that are falling apart and they hope he will reconstruct. So I'm curious because he didn't reconstruct them obviously, but I'm curious what happened to those frescoes because in our age, of course, the reconstruction project happened um, much more uh, elaborately, but I'm just curious um, if we lost anything uh, because of Lohov's inability to work on that for financial reasons and as such. His wife deserves a uh, huge um, thanks because she was so dedicated to his work that she, A, preserved everything. After his death, she preserved the studio and and her dedication to find um, the space for, uh, for his work. And his children, his daughter actually became a translator and his son is an art historian who also uh, uh, kind of, but he's a scholar of Renaissance and not his father. But like his second generation continues to work in humanities and art history. So great life. It's just very sad that he was not able to see his uh, lifelong project finding um, a place, but at least it found a place and it's here in our great country. Yeah, and, and your scholarship is, is continuing the story and sharing it with this lovely audience today. Um, we had one quick question too before we end, um, and I want to put in a plug for next or for our next program, but um, we've got another great question from Mary Ellen asking, since you were talking about that, that fresco, did he actually reconstruct on the fresco or as a separate work? He, he both. Uh, when he made the copies, he would use canvas and he would uh, use cement on canvas and he developed a process when it would be like fresco seco, a like dry fresco process, but on canvas. And he also worked on restoration of the actual frescoes. I didn't really show those, but there, there is a, like, you, uh, there are some not so much on internet what he worked on, but yeah, he worked on multiple uh, Italian museum projects when they were constructed. So both. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and thank you so, so much, Katarina, for being here and sharing this lovely story and everyone for tuning in today. Um, I wanted to quickly before, I'll let Katarina say the final word, but quickly we do have, we're off next week. I hope everyone has a great holiday weekend, but we'll be back the following week with an art at noon that I'm gonna drop in the chat with a Papa alum, an artist and illustrator named, named Kate Samworth, one of my favorite artists. And then later on in the month, we have another scholar here to talk about art and the climate crisis. So feel free to check us out online. We'll be sending out e-blasts, but if you have any questions, um, you can also email me. So Katarina, I'll let you say. I just want to thank everyone and thank you for great questions. And um, I love that my, uh, you know, it's some remarkable connection between cultures, between artists, between institutions. Uh, so that started as kind of weird project that ended up in something hopefully interesting and uh, important. So thank you all. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, don't miss the next uh, week or whatever uh, case is talking because uh, her illustrations are really, really super great. Thank you. Take care. Feel free to unmute yourself on your way out, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Laura and Denise, everyone. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> it's great.